Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Man of Ann Arbor podcast brought to you by the good people at New Amendment. Nick, what's going on, man? Give me real quick one uh, New Year's resolution you're trying to work on. One New Year's resolution is to never drink uh, 1942 Don Julio again because it did not treat me too well on New Year's Day. Boom. How about you, Stu? So we're doing, uh, <laughs> me and I for great, like people do the dry January, right? Mm-hmm. It's too much. So we're doing dry weekdays because the weekends, like, you got to give me something. I can't do a whole month with just dry. But I don't think I'm, like, classy enough to drink Don Julio 1942. Was it too much? Is it good? Yeah, well, I so I like it chilled. Like, I, I keep it in – I kept it in the freezer all day. And um, I was really just with a lar- – I, I was with a pretty large group. And every 20 to 30 minutes, Club Don would – would resume everyone would kind of gather around and we would take a shot and whew, it was one too many so january 1st that day was a struggle for me but i'm here to i'm here for the next podcast so we're all we're all good to go club don did you go out in philly or did you just have people over no i, I was just at my in-laws place uh and we just had like a bunch of family and friends over um we had a good group of people and uh yeah we had we had, we had so much fun it just the next day was uh it was a little bit rough i was like man i gotta gotta stay stay away from the tequila for a little bit yeah we we don't my family really don't really do new year's eve we do like we blow out christmas night and the fireball came out my sister got a candy a plant like a three foot tall candy cane plastic candy cane full of fireball shooters so yeah that made a couple rounds mm. and that gets you just wake up feeling like just tear any and then you got my nieces who are five and two just screaming all morning they don't they don't care at all and i'm like all right, i need to go home i need to get out of here like this is not working out for me right now it's not where i need to recover but yeah hey trust me man like it i think that's when i realized this hangover this hangover hit different when you because when you have a baby to take care of the next day that's that's when it really hits you and you're like man you can't just sit on the couch and do nothing you have to be responsible you know for another human being so um that was my struggle that was my struggle that day and that's why me and don are getting divorced man me and don we're just no, no longer hang out together. you'll be back you always say it and then you're like so you someone hands it to you you look at don again you're like all right don i do i do like you all right yeah, yeah. maybe maybe a couple months maybe a couple weeks eh, maybe next weekend we'll see we'll yeah. see how it goes yeah exactly we got a lot to talk about it has been a whirlwind ride for michigan so let's get into the x's and o's right now it's been crazy for Michigan. A loss to Central Michigan. They're three and zero in Big Ten play, looking really good in Big Ten play. You can't really figure them out, even though I think I got a, a pretty good handle on everything of what's going on. Uh, we've all been there with the CMU games, but I mean, w- where do we start? Well, let, let's start with let's start with the bad, then we'll get into the good parts of it. So that that Central Michigan loss. I think we've both been there, right? We've been playing teams and we that we should be killing, and it's they stick around, stick around. We end up losing a game, no matter what level you're at. You've, you've had it in high school and college and the pros. It's, we've all experienced it. And this one stung a little because we're we're still trying to like just will Michigan to improve, and this was like sort of a step back, even though I I, I don't agree with it because they've shown the improvement with the Penn State game and the Maryland game, but. What did you see in that Central Michigan game? Because I have my opinions. Like, what did you see? And from a player standpoint, from a player's perspective, like having gone through it, having these games, like what was the reason for you? Like a couple things that stood out. I mean, for me, big picture, you look at that game and it's I feel like it really starts with just a lack of a lack of effort and a lack of pride. If that's, you know, if you want to look at it that way. And you can kind of narrow it down. Right Say it again. You're going in on them right away. Oh well, you could. I mean, you can narrow it down to the to the to the offensive rebound. Like they finish, you know, they have 17, 17 offensive rebounds for twenty three points. And again, that's just that's an effort thing. But on your home floor against a team that's you know probably no offense to Central Michigan, like probably one of the worst teams in the country. Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah, they're not great. They're not. They're not good. I mean. On your home floor to lose a game like that, it, it really it can't even be about X's and O's as much as it is like pride. Like you got to win that game. 
But I do think that there's a lot of positives to take from this. And we've been going back and forth with glass half full, glass half half empty. And, and that, that's kind of how this season has been going. But, you know, Juwan Howard talked post game after Central Michigan. And he talked about how many games they've had this year. You know, games where they're the favorites to win. They should win. And the game's close down the stretch and they eke out a win, you know, in the last couple of minutes. And, you know, although those games should have been won by more, it still counts as a W in the win column. And so everyone moves along like, you know, hey, we won the game. No big deal. No problem. We'll just move on to the next game. And there's never been that kind of like gut check, reality check moment where you have to look at yourself in the mirror and be like, damn, what's what are we doing wrong? And I think it took this loss, the Central Michigan, you know, an embarrassing home loss for them to finally have that moment where they look at they look at themselves in the mirror and they say, all right, what you know, w- what's the issue here? And I think, you know, them having that players only meeting, you know, I, I want to get your opinion on this. If, if you know, if you've experienced anything like this throughout your career, but those player only meetings can be can be very effective if everyone is open, honest, truthful and willing to take criticism. And from this, from the looks of it, from the last two games from Maryland and Penn state, I feel like that, that loss to central Michigan was the best thing that ever happened to this team because they look completely hundred percent different. And, and I want to get your opinion on this. And if you think it's kind of bogus or, you know, if you think those team, those player only meetings really, really matter. Was it player only? Cause John talked about after the Penn state game, that they had a meeting. Maybe they did both. Regardless, you have a meeting of the minds, as Bakari Alexander used to say it. And it's it can be very important. There's how many meetings have you had? Yeah, you know, especially at the beginning of the season. It's like, oh, we're hyped up. And it's kind of just fluff. It's mostly air. Um and it, you know, everyone's just kind of worried about themselves. And then if you win, all right, we're together. If you lose, you kind of those those early meetings and the hoorah meetings don't really mean anything. Like when you can sit there and really take responsibility for your play, for your performance as a coach, for players as they play, like that's huge. My, I know we both have stories about these types of meetings. My story is junior year when they say, you know, the program turned around, which whatever. It was, it was right before the Michigan State game when, uh, when I uh, hit the shot, wink, wink. The, we lost to Minnesota, and I think we're now one in five in the Big Ten or one in four, and we should have beat Minnesota. They were not good, just not good at all. I think we lost on our home floor, and we finally had to come together. And basically, I think it kind of started with Beeline. I would love to say that I spoke up, and I probably did, but I don't remember what I said. I can't remember anything in my career. But, you know, it was a real kind of – coming to Jesus moment, but in a personal sense, we were all, there was times that year where like guys were crying after games because Beeline was getting into them. And I remember we played a game and I won't name names, but two guys like cried after the post game speech and pretty much like stormed out of the locker room. And I was like, what the hell is going on right now? Like this is mayhem and there's too much talent in this room and I'm dealing with a bunch of babies. And I, I was a junior, but like me and Zach were the oldest. We we're trying to be seniors and it was a lot to deal with. And then finally at that breaking point where we just took responsibility for ourselves and, it, and Beeline did a really good job then better at that moment of explaining like, we're not going to win unless you take responsibility for yourself. You have to st- stop pointing the finger. Everybody, all the time, everybody's mistake was, oh, it was your fault. It was your fault. You missed that rotation. And it was bogus. It was totally bogus. And we had guys, you know, we had Darius and Tim who, let's be honest, they were looking to the NBA. Like they were just looking about the next level. And that's fine. I'm not opposed to it because it motivates guys. But we were more worried about stats and and not getting caught making mistakes. Because, you you know, with Beeline, every game, they're writing down your mistakes. They're charting your mistakes. So – you get in your feelings about it. And you're like, no, no, that's not my mistake. That's his fault. And then you get mad at that guy. And then you have this like boiling rage against somebody else for no reason. Cause you don't want to take responsibility for your mistake. So after that, like we just completely flipped the switch and mm-hmm. it was, it was huge for us. That, that meeting was huge. And I, and that game against Michigan state 
was a big turning point. They say that's when the program turned. But I I remember even saying post-game after that Michigan State win that even if we had lost that game, I felt like this was a completely different team and that we were still on the right path. Now, that may be wrong. Winning always helps with momentum. But it was it was monumental, and it just clicked for everyone because we were just tired of losing. And I, I, I would imagine – I've seen it. I want to get your story, but I do want to talk about after that. Like I saw it mostly from Hunter and I don't want to get into it, but you have an experience like that as well. No. Yeah. I mean, my freshman year, um, well, and sorry, let me touch on what you said first. I, I, I think it is crazy too, that that game against Michigan state that you guys played. I do really believe that was the game that turned things around for the program. And it's really wild to see the progression the years after after that, but that was 100% the turning point. So it is crazy to see how if, how much meaning and how much weight is carried on some of those meetings that can sometimes just be between players um, and just how important it is. But for, for me, we had the same thing my freshman year when Trey and Tim um, and, and all those guys were on the team. And we lost at Penn State, who I believe they were 0-15 in the Big Ten at that point. And keep in mind, keep in mind that year we were, you know, at one point ranked number one in the country, you know, had all these high hopes, high expectations. And it was towards the end of the Big Ten season for whatever reason, if it was like getting comfortable with being number one and guys reading into everything that was happening on being said on social media. And there was a there was a lack of focus and commitment um, that was felt around the team, and it wasn't until that loss at Penn State, which was super embarrassing for us. And I've never seen Coach Beeline so mad after the game. He again, similar to what you said, absolutely ripped us in the locker room, and we had a players only meeting the following day. Um, we went out to eat, and everyone had to say what they had to say. They got it off their chest. And we started a social media ban for the rest of the season. And there was, there just became this kind of new commitment, new life to, hey, we're just, there's a month left in this season. We're heading to March. We're going to be all in 100%. No one's going to be, you know, distracted by this or that or, you know, what someone else is saying. Everyone lock in and do what you need to do to win. And that loss ended up being a turning point for us and we ended up going all the way to the national championship that year i mean grant we we lost to louisville in the national championship but it served as a huge momentum moment for us where everyone kind of got their heads on straight and we looked forward and we never looked back sometimes in these players only meetings i'll roll my eyes so far in the back of my head that it feels like it's going to get stuck there because certain guys just are not on the same page with like winning opinions and that's that sounds cocky but like okay sorry jeff like that's not what we're going for here like that's not the point of this meeting but you guys had that meeting and you don't have to go into like super detail but sound like you guys are all on the same page like what were you talking about in that meeting what like it was a social media event was it just simply focused was it pretty easy or were you were you guys like being honest being like hey this it's not Tim, Tim, Jordan, whoever, like you got to do this. Well, in terms of, in terms of X's and O's talking actual basketball scheme, the only thing we were talking about was, was defense because offense, we had no issue. We like, we could score the ball. We had no issues with that. We had so many different guys that could score the ball. Our issue was no one really wanted to play defense. We all wanted to get buckets and so it was kind of one of those things where someone had to check Trey, you know, Trey had to check Tim, Tim had to check me. Like everyone had to kind of check each other and be like, you got to step up and take a charge. You got to be, you got to talk to me on, on this coverage. And this, the same things that we have been preaching to this Michigan team, just you and I on this podcast, those are the kinds of, kinds of things that we were saying to each other. And then on top of that, also, it was, it was more so just, we're tuning out the entire world. We're tuning out what everyone else is saying. And these 15 guys that we have right here, this is all we're listening to from here on out. And that's why the social media ban came into place, um, which was at the time hard for me because I was, I love Twitter. I love chatting and interacting with fans and just seeing what people were saying. So 
it was tough for me at the time, but now looking back at it, it really, I think it really helped us. It really helped us, you know, maintain that focus and, um, it gave us some great momentum heading into the tournament. Yeah, no, it's, um, like you said, it can be super important with this team. It's even, it's, it's different than like your team meeting. Cause your team meeting is like, okay, we know what's going on. Let's just do it. This team is still learning a lot about defense, right? They're still trying to figure out how to make the rotations, how to anticipate the rotations, how to anticipate whatever the case, whatever it is on defense. So, you know, they're still making some mistakes out there, but the attention to detail, like let's from boxing out in the Central Michigan game, going to Maryland, then going to Penn State, vastly improved. Like you saw guys finishing their box outs. There wasn't just like a hip check. I even saw Jet one time help on a roll man from the weak side check him to make sure that Hunter could get back to box him out. And then he went to go get his man to box out. And I'm like, there's no way he's done that all year. Nothing against Jet, but like, that's not an easy thing to do. And they've been so bad at it. Like that was obviously a, a point of focus for him. And I think all around um, those little things add up. I do think that it started with Hunter and I want to go to the Maryland game and something I haven't seen Hunter do, and this is like a, just a little anecdote from the first quarter, but it's a microcosm of what I we've been talking about that he needs to do more of. And it was, they're up 2-0, and it's their like second or third possession. Kobe's bringing up the left side. Terrence is in the left corner. And Hunter's kind of in the middle, kind of coming up, uh, just the middle of the court. Mm-hmm. And he, as soon as Kobe crosses half court, Hunter's running down the block, and he's pointing to Kobe to pass the ball to Terrence in the corner. Mm-hmm. Like, give me the ball, post up. He hadn't done that. I haven't seen him do that all year. He did that last year. He was even doing that pointing his freshman year, saying like, all right, you pass the ball here. I'm going to go set a screen. Pass the ball there. Like, he was directing traffic as a freshman, and he hadn't been doing that as much this year. I'm sure he's done it, just not as much, especially in the past few games. And Terrence ended up shooting a three off of it because the guy backed off in anticipation of the post pass and hit a three. It was Great shot, aggressive play by Terrence. But he set the tone early in that game. And in Central Michigan, you saw – I know it was a junk zone that Central Michigan was playing, and they didn't quite figure it out. So there are some factors there. It's not like Michigan wanted to lose that game against Central Michigan or, like, they were just phoning it in 100%. Like, I don't want to, like, rail on them. Like, I, I, I hate it all the time when fans are like, no, they didn't want it enough. And it's like, well, what do you mean they didn't want it enough? Like, that just that doesn't exist. That's not a thing. Like, maybe yeah. some guys were like, really, overall, like, the vast majority of the time, that's not the case. But he, I think Hunter just kind of put his foot down. I was like, it starts with me. And, I mean, no one else played super great offensively. I think everyone filled their role really well. But, like, that was the Hunter show in the first half. That was it. Like, he controlled the paint controlled the game in so many different ways. He was hedging harder. He was being active in the passing lane and recovering from the hedges on defense. And mm-hmm. it carried over in that Penn State game. And, yeah, you want to be Big Ten Player of the Year, like that's what that's, those are things you got to do. And I think he had a lack of confidence a little bit in the Kentucky game, in the North Carolina game. And he kind of got beat down maybe too strong of a phrase. But he realized, like, oh, I am good. I can do this. Like, let, let's go. And and he did it. He put his mind to it and he did it. And I'm curious if you think, I mean, I, I know you you agree with it in some sense because we've talked about it, but if there's more to it, there's obviously more to it than just that. But like, what else have you seen? You can touch on the Hunter stuff, but, you know, what else have you seen from the Central Michigan game to the Maryland Penn State game that you really love uh, specifically, like X and O stuff? Well, specifically for the Penn State game, I loved. So I, here's the thing. The Maryland game, I obviously he had 32 points on 13 for 16 from the field and dominant performance. Um, but the way he did it that uh, in the Maryland game versus how he played in Penn state was completely different. And what I mean is in Penn state I, against Penn state, I love the way throughout the entire 40 minutes, there was a steady dose of Hunter post-ups. Like it didn't matter how effective any, any other play was, they were just like we talked about the other the other week. Every couple of possessions, they were throwing it into him. And whether he was drawing a foul, drawing a double team, they were they were playing through him. And we've talked about it. That's how it should be. Now against Maryland, he had a dominant performance, but I felt 
I actually felt like he did get his post-ups, but I felt like he was getting the majority of his buckets through pick and rolls. And whether it was Doug or Jet or Kobe, they were coming, they, you know, they were getting downhill. He was rolling hard and they were finding him for that pocket pass or even a couple of times in transition, you know, Doug was kind of dropping it behind them uh, for, for uh, Hunter while he was trailing. And for a lot of those buckets, I felt like he didn't even really have to work that hard where I feel like he's used to having a, you know, bang bodies down low to, to, to get his, that Maryland game, it was like things were being, you know, handed to him on a platter and, you know, he was just getting easy buckets at the rim, uh, which I love, which I love because that goes to our point. That goes to our point too, is that the ball screen play offensively has improved a great deal. And the the, the decision-making, the reads on the floor, the IQ of these guys, I think it's starting to come together. And, you know, we, we've said Jet, Kobe, and Doug, they all have the ability and and the, the athleticism, the skill to get into the paint and make plays. And now you're, you're starting to be able to see them, you know, make those plays for Hunter, even Doug against, you know, Penn State. Doug's, you know, making that cross-court pass on the money to Joey, um, you know, for a three. And to me, that's that's what excites me. That's what really excites me because, you know, we've seen in glimpses uh, certain guys do those things and to see it come together for a couple of games now when they've needed it most, it's, you're like, all right, finally. And I'm, I'm more thinking glass half full now instead of half empty. And we're actually, you know, after Central Michigan, I wasn't even half empty. The glass was empty. There was nothing in the glass anymore. And now we're back to half full. So yeah. I'm calling that a win. You texted me after the, you texted me after the Central Michigan game, like, like so basically like questioning the glass half full mentality. And that was pretty funny. But I, I kind of want to break down for the fans that watched Michigan, how beautiful that Doug play was. And you understand mm-hmm. it. He, he's coming off the ball screen. He's got Hunter rolling. And he's got Joey on the weak side as the bulldog, as Beeline called it. Um, and basically, the big man was kind of in no man's land. He got Hunter rolling hard. And the big man doesn't know what to do. Hunter's or Joey's guy has got a help from the weak side. And basically, Doug took his time. Like, he was real patient. This is where the beauty of it is. Like, usually Doug's, like, going – you know, he's pretty twitchy. He'll just go right at it right away, and he's just going to attack. This one, he took his time. He slowed down like a veteran point guard. He froze the the uh, opposite wing trying to help in and uh, bump Hunter on the roll because, like, well, if the ball's not being passed, like, I don't know what to do because Hunter's wide open and just on a dime threw to Joey for a, a back-breaking three for Penn State. And that goes to show that, you know, I love to see it from Doug because he's in control and there's, I think, an unfair. It is unfair. It, it, it's very unfair tag that he's been getting about being crazy and hectic and out of control. Like, yeah, I even with like a, a air ball floater that he had in the Penn State game, I still think the 98 percent of the rest of the game was in control. Like. He's still figuring it out, but he's not just bouncing off the walls. And so his progression there has been beautiful to watch because he's really picking his spots well. And all the guards, I mean, Jet, Jet's just Jet. He's doing it. And really, Jet's been playing probably the worst just because he hasn't been shooting as well. And that's fine. He's been playing well otherwise, offensively. Kobe and, and Doug, I think, have done an, an unbelievable job of being direct. Like, the whole team has just decided – besides like Jet, because he's always just aggressive. He's always himself. To just be direct and to the point. We talked about it over and over. Like, just make a decision. Just do something. Be direct. And these guys are, like, not really looking at each other anymore and, like, being stagnant on offense. Started with Hunter. And, you know, Kobe's done a really good job. And it's gone. Doug has done a really good job. Even Terrence has done a good job of being a little more direct in certain areas. So they're just kind of all more on the same page with everything. Uh, but I do want to ask you about Kobe because I think he's really turned into Eli Brooks. I think he's like forming the com- that complete transformation. Eli Brooks. He's playing defense. Mm-hmm. This kid, dude. Get, this guy gets steals. Like his hands are crazy. It's like Pat Bev type mm-hmm. hands. I mean, I would not want to be holding the ball on the perimeter and when he's hounding you. He's been he's been he's been awesome for them. And it's crazy because. Just just a week or two ago, we were having these conversations about him. We were so excited about the way he looked, and it you almost felt bad for him because he just couldn't get the ball to drop. And then it was like, bam, all of a sudden it was 
you know, the Minnesota game and he, he strings together a couple of good games and you can see him now. He's not thinking about anything. He's just going out there and playing and he's being himself. He's having fun. He's playing with swagger. He's playing with a chip on his shoulder and he's doing it on both ends. He's, I think by far their best two way player. Um, like you said, he's an absolute dog on defense, has great hands, knows how to use his body, knows how to move his feet. And then offensively, as we talked about, he's becoming a three-level scorer. He can really he can score off the dribble. He can score from three. He can score in the mid-range. He's getting to his left hand, going to the rim, no matter what. It doesn't matter which way you force him. You send him down to the base. It doesn't matter. He's getting to his left and finishing. And again, you just you love to see it kind of all come together for him and and have the game slow down. Yeah, man, Kobe has just been fun to watch. I could talk about him for like 20 more minutes straight and it's going to be fun to keep talking about him all year and watch his progression and just break down his play um overall they've been fun since the central michigan game to watch uh it's gonna be interesting to see how they respond to all this i mean these these meetings are important but they can wear off and i just i hope they don't get too comfortable you know what i'm saying yeah and and to that point i i went on instagram after their game against Penn State, and again, I'm, I'm I'm happy for these guys. It's two huge wins in a row for them, and you can you can kind of feel things are coming together for them. But I go on Instagram, and there's a video of of them, you know, dancing and celebrating in the locker room. And again, I'm I'm all for you know being happy and and you know celebrating after a win. But I just I don't want them to I don't want them to lose focus or get excited because they won two games. I it's like. You know what? You're you're supposed to beat Penn State at home. You're supposed to beat Maryland at home. That's the mindset you have to have when you're when you have aspirations of going to the NCAA tournament or or winning a Big Ten championship. Those are I should win this game. You don't you shouldn't be excited about winning. You should expect that. Um, and at least that's how I approach when I was at Michigan. That's how we approach every game. You know, I'm not celebrating after I, I I beat Penn State at home. I'm like, yeah, that's what I was supposed to do. So for these guys, I hate to be the one like giving them some tough love, but I hope that 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 meeting that they had, I hope that continues to carry on throughout the season and they still feel that pain and embarrassment that they felt after the Central Michigan loss, because it's not going to if you if you just, you know, do it for these two games and then kind of forget about everything and go back to what was the normal before you're not making the NCAA tournament. You have they haven't won enough. They haven't won enough good quality games on their resume yet to, to get to that spot. So, you know, for me, I hate to be the guy giving them tough love, but, you know, I, I just I really hope that, you know, now that they've got some momentum and good rhythm, that they continue that and they they maintain their focus, uh, you know, moving forward throughout the season. I think I think Beeline's roasted our brains. You and me both are the same way. It's like, well, <laughs> doesn't matter. Move on to the next one. <laughs> and it's. They literally would like they would ask me in the media and they'd by the time I got to senior year, like you you know the all the media people and they know your personality. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, you guys know what I'm gonna say. Like, I'm not excited about this win. We gotta go to the next one. And cause that was just mm-hmm. ingrained in our brains from day one. Um, so yeah, we're you and me both are a little bit fun police on that. But it's uh yeah, it's a it's a fair point. Like we'll see how they respond. You can have fun, but it, you know, if you turn around and you're like, all right, well, I don't have to be as focused on this help side defense now next game against Michigan State. You're going to get your ass kicked, and it's going to be another wake-up call. You're going to get embarrassed by Michigan State. Um, so, yeah, it will be interesting to see. But transitioning there, let's get into the scouting report for the next couple games. So they got Michigan State and Iowa coming up. You know, sorry, Iowa, but I'm really looking forward to Michigan State more than Iowa. Uh, but two good tests. Michigan State, I think, you know, to give my opinion right off the bat, is a tough matchup for Michigan. And I think it's going to boil down to ball screen defense. Like, I think Walker and Hogard can give them fits because they're veterans. You know, mm-hmm. I think it's going to be interesting to see how they play them. I think Pickett was a great player to play against to see how they're going to manage it. They were perfectly fine with Pickett scoring. They, they would have been fine with him scoring 40 if he wanted to take all the shots. And I'm not opposed to it in some games. Like when you have a point guard like that that's going to dominate the ball, 
let's say two guards, if you're going to run ball screens, if you're going to just destroy Michigan with ball screens, which I would imagine is, is going to probably do the majority of the time. But what Penn State did and what they didn't mind Penn State doing, what Michigan didn't mind Penn State doing was just having Pickett dominate the scoring and no one else is going to get going because Michigan State probably doesn't have the same exact shoot, like the as good of shooting wings that Miss Penn State has. Um, but they're like, all right, well, then the other guys will get out of rhythm and they won't hit as many threes. And it and it worked out well. That the little white kid, the Cornell transfer from Penn State, just didn't have a good game shooting. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, I think the whole rhythm offensively was just one player, which kind of throws – can throw a team through a loop a little bit. Um, when the when the ball is not moving around, it can affect every like one through five on the offensive end, and then you go on a defensive end, and it'll affect you there because hey, I haven't touched the ball in eight possessions. Um, so I, it'll be I'll be curious to see if they do that. There, I mean, I would like to make Walker and Hogard scores, like let them go try and score thirty and shoot like a bunch off the dribble. I mean, they're good. Don't get me wrong, but. That way you're not giving up like easy dunks and stuff because your rotations are bad. So I don't know what you think you like, what do you want them to work on? Or like, what did you see against Penn state like to keep or like to change going in this Michigan state game? Well, I agree. The one thing I, I really like to your point about, about um, them letting Pickett, you know, do his thing is at least all game. They were consistent with that. They weren't sending two, three bodies at him. They were playing him straight up. And, you know, sometimes Pickett was taking eight dribbles, kind of like, you know, pounding into whoever it was to kind of take a tough two. And it's one of those things where it's like, all right, go ahead. Go ahead. Take, take, you know, we're going to body up. And if you're going to score, you're, if you're going to score those twos over us all day long, we'll take it. But we're not going to overhelp and send two, three people at you and then have the shooter start spraying. And, you know, that's when the kind of momentum of game of games change is when a team starts reeling off threes like that. And so I, I like that they were consistent with the all game long and they were like, hey, we're going to play one on one. We're going to let him. If he scores, he scores. Great. If not, you know, we're not going to change our coverages. And that's all we've been preaching about this whole time is it, whatever you're doing, just have some consistency with it, because up until this point, even with their ball screen stuff, it's just been like, all right, we're going to hard show this time. And then this time we're going to be in a drop. And then this time we're going to make up a coverage. We're going to switch or not communicate. It's just been pure chaos for them. And finally, these last two games, it's it's felt like, one, everyone's given a tremendous amount of effort. And two, they've all been on the same page. No matter what they've been doing defensively, they've all been on the same page. And that's what I've wanted to see. And obviously, they're, they're you know, they're working on these things behind closed doors. And, I, you know, you want to see that continue against Michigan State and Iowa. And now, again, I, I don't know how that's going to look. Are you going to let the guards, you know, kind of score buckets and, and go off? Or are you going to, you know, rotate more towards them and, and let, you know, Michigan State shoot? I, don't, I would say I don't think Michigan State's as good of a shooting team as Penn State. I, but, you know, I, I don't know. I don't they're, know. Yeah. They're not shooting as many threes. I mean, as a team, they're shooting well. Um, thirty-seven point five percent, forty seventh in the country. So I mean that that's a good percentage. But Actually, let's yeah. let's go through it because this will this will kind of reflect, I think, how they're gonna play and possibly foresee very similar to how they played Pickett. So Tyson Walker, little guy, mm-hmm. shooting thirty-seven point seven, about thirty-eight percent from three, four point four attempts. So not bad. Like maybe you don't want to be giving up a lot of off dribble. You know. You don't want to be like slouching back. I mean, Hunter, I think we'll play up on him a little bit, at least like some coverage kind of discourage a three point shot off the ball screen. Next guy is Joey Hauser. You really don't want shooting the ball. He's shooting 43%, like 4.6 attempts a game. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the other guys, like not named Hogard, shooting the other top minute guys 40%, 43%, 40%. And that, those combined, those three, well, one of them is Malik Hall. So Jay Nakins and, and uh, Pierre Brooks are shooting like combined about seven attempts at like 41%. So that's really good. But Hogarth yeah. shoots 25%. So, yeah. and his two pointers are at 44%. So that's not going to kill you if he keeps shooting two pointers all the time, unless you're giving him wide open layups. Like, right. unless you just give him the ones and he can shoot over 50%. But if you're going to play the percentages, Make Hogarth a score. He's only averaging 11 points a game, and I know they want to put him 
in some ball screen action because he's averaging 6.4 assists. Like that, that's his MO. So yeah. make him uncomfortable, make him a scorer, and it won't put as much pressure on the rotations for Michigan defending shooters, which, mm-hmm. you know, if you simplify it again, like, all right, we don't care. We used to play Taylor Battle, like a lot of guys, you played a lot of guys, and you're like, all right, like that guy is just going to score and get 30. This is a little different situation. You're kind of giving him points, but it all stands like we'll just defend the rest and the rest will take care of itself. So I think it could be a similar situation. I just don't know how Michigan state is going to attack Michigan. It could, could go many different ways. No, I, I, I agree. I agree. And, but I mean, most importantly too, just, you know, going to Breslin, that's, it's just a, it's, it's a special place to play special rivalry. And sometimes you got to, you got to throw the scouting report out the window and it's just who's, you know, who's going to be a dog today. And I know for my experiences at Breslin or just playing against Michigan state in general, that's all for me. That's what it always, that's what it always came down to. Not so much the X's and O's, but more about like, you know, you joked about it before who wants this game, who wants this game more, but legit, sometimes that's what it came down to. It's, it was very much a pride thing. And so you want to see that on display, um, you know, when these two teams go at it. I played Duke in the Garden my freshman year. I basically had a bull cut because I was too afraid to go to a barber in Ann Arbor. And I was less scared in that game than I was, like, my first game at the Breslin Center. So mm-hmm. it's a scary place. Like, they, it gets hyped. It gets loud. And everyone there hates you. And you can kind of – you feel the rivalry through – at that point, you're pretty much just being told what the rivalry is. Like you're, everyone's talking at you about what it is until you finally experience it. Um, so yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how the guys react. It's going to be one of my favorite things to watch. I think you're going to have to have a guy like Kobe who carried them in the Central Michigan game in the second half to keep them around. I think you're going to have to have some performances because you know, that kind of environment is already like minus five points, right? That's going to be at least a couple more missed shots than normal just from from nerves. I mean, I could be wrong, but on average, that's kind of what the home court advantage of the Big Ten is, right? That's like minus five points off your average. That's basically what it is. And Breslin, maybe maybe a little more, let's say like minus seven, minus eight, um, if it's really Mm -hmm. rocking. So that'll be fun to watch. And I'm really excited to watch Hunter. This transitions well into our Hunter-focused word on campus. So, like I said, I'm excited to see how Hunter responds. And he's been talking a lot of smack this year, right? He's playing the heel well. He's got the podcast. And he's doing it right. Like, he's making himself a lot of money. He's getting a lot of recognition. He's, he's, He's figured it out. This week's word on campus is definitely Michigan State out react, but I want to talk about a couple things with Hunter off court, and that is involving the podcast. We'll go with the first one is calling Wisconsin scumbags and basically saying, like, yeah, it's a it's a mutual feeling. Like there's no love lost there between the two sides. Like it's not he said it wasn't the same thing as him and Turgeon going at it because Turgeon didn't recruit him and like the Maryland players not really caring because it had nothing to do with them. He said, no, we all, nobody likes me at Wisconsin and I don't like them. And we totally honest with you, I was fine with it. Like you, you've done some smack talking, maybe not in the media or on a podcast and you're back in your day in college, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm fine with it. He was just honest. Like it, that's the truth, right? Nothing he said was wrong. No. I, and obviously there's some, there is, there's a lot of bad blood between those teams after, after their meeting last year. I, you know, it's just funny because it can't it, it, him making that st- him making that comment comes at a weird time because they don't even play for another month, so now it's like you're sitting around wait. I'm sitting around have it circled on my calendar. Can't wait for that. You know, I can't wait for that matchup now. Uh, but you know, that's that's Hunter. Just you know, he's he's a vet now. He's been around. He's he's that guy. He's comfortable in his own skin. And hey, if he wants to make that comment, if that's how he feels. Go ahead, just you know, be ready for be ready for what comes with making those comments, which is going to be a lot, you know, a lot of backlash, a lot of hate. You know, you're going to have a huge X on your back. So as long as he's prepared for those things, then I'm all for it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. The other one we don't have to get into because it's 
probably more Barstool shenanigans. That's just annoying. But they didn't release an episode or they t- they took it down or something about uh, a co-host of his on the podcast comparing Izzo to Hitler, which, you know, never a good idea at all to compare anybody to Hitler. Uh, so mm-hmm. there's just a lot going on on that podcast. But, like, they know what they're doing. And so, you know, I think that if he can control it, it's fine. We all talk about, I mean, Beeline would have lost his mind with like this stuff. Right? Oh, that wouldn't have, that wouldn't have flown with, with Beeline. No, he would have straight up. It would have been like, yeah, it, it would have pushed him out the door like he did Coach K. Like he could not, that would, wouldn't have flown whatsoever. It didn't matter how good you are. Um, but I am of the camp. Like you guys had your social media ban, and I can kind of see it for other reasons, which maybe we won't get into. Maybe guys looking ahead and in the future a little too much, looking at social media and what people are saying about them. I think Hunter is perfectly fine with like talking trash and getting hate and then going out there and scoring 30. I think he's pretty used to it. Um, so I'm not really worried about it as a distraction, and I can't wait for the next bad game when I'm going to hear on Twitter, like, oh, Hunter's distracted. And I'm like, I don't think so. <laughs> I really don't think so. If anything, it's going to pump him up to play better. Like, it's going to make him more motivated because he's now got to back it up. So, I don't know. Yeah. I'm not really concerned about it at all. Are you? No, I'm, I'm not concerned about it either. And just watching him play these last couple of games, like, he's fired up out there. You could tell he's fired up. He's showing emotion. He's taking leadership. And like you said, the way he came out in that Maryland game, and kind of just demanded to have things done a certain way, demanding the ball in the post, uh, being demonstrative. It's just that's that's what we've been wanting to see out of Hunter. All we know it's in we know it's in him. You know we've seen it before. We know what he's capable of. So um, I love that he's confident. I love that he's comfortable in his own skin. You gotta if you if he wants to make those comments and that's what's gonna help him. You know be motivated and play his best. Then you know good for him but again you just got to be ready to back those things up because with making those comments is going to come a lot of attention and backlash so hope he's ready to uh hope he's ready to ball out yeah yeah give me give me a couple things you're looking forward to in the next couple games that you want to see whether it's game planning a specific type of offense defense what did you like you want to see him carry over you got something on, uh, on top of mind going back to going back to doug you know we talked about that pass that he made to joey um you know, on the shakeup for three. First of all, I love to see Joey super aggressive knocking down shots. We've we've said how many times that we desperately needed someone off the bench to score. So I definitely would love to see more of that. But with Doug, he made a comment. He made a comment after the game uh, regarding that pass. I think someone asked him, "Is it slowing down for you?" And he was, like, "Yeah, the game's slowing down." And he even acknowledged. He said. A couple of weeks ago, that pass would have been either too high or too low. And it's because I'm, you know, I'm finally slowing down, get a little bit more comfortable that I'm able to make those reads. And I saw that and I'm like, love it. I love that because, you know, un- unfair sometimes that he's been labeled as out of control and a little too frank, a little too frantic. But a lot of times that is it, it, it you know, he was a little out of control. And so, for him to acknowledge that that play wasn't something he may, you know, it wasn't a play he may have made a couple of weeks ago, but he can make it now. That got me excited because look, Jalen's out and they're kind of giving Doug the keys and saying, Hey, you gotta, you know, you gotta run this team. And as a freshman point guard, there's going to be a lot of mistakes that come with that, but to see him get a little bit more comfortable and, um, you know, to have, I think zero turnovers in that Penn, in that Penn state game, um, you know, that's huge. That's huge. And again, it's not going to be perfect all at once, but to see him make those strides, um, that, that gives me a lot of faith and a lot of confidence in this team moving forward. So, uh, we know he can score, we know he can get to the rim and, and, you know, make some electric plays, but making those kinds of reads for a shakeup or, you know, hitting Hunter on a pick and roll with a dime, you know, you want to see your point guard getting everyone involved. And and I would love to see him, you know, build on those kind of plays and do even more of that moving forward. And also, quick other point I got to say, I, I mentioned a couple of weeks ago about the turnovers. I think Michigan's number one in in the in the country and taking care of the ball. They are I mean, they're they're spectacular at, at valuing each possession. I think 
uh, Penn State, they had uh, four turnovers, 15 assists. And no, sorry, that was Maryland. And then, you know, Penn State, it was same kind of deal. Um, we had three turnovers, 11 assists. And I mean, that's that's incredible stuff right there. And if their defense, again, if their pick and roll defense and overall defense can kind of build and they can keep playing with the same energy they have the last couple of couple of games, I I, I just I, I like the way the team's trending right now. They have so many, you know, good things going on for them that, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a glass three quarters full right now kind of guy. I'm feeling that way about things. That's good. I like it. Yeah, I agree with you. I uh, I want to see Doug do more of that. I didn't realize he said that, which is exciting. That that gives me confidence. And to have that self-awareness is really key, especially for a young guy. I think that bodes really well for him and his progress and his future with everything. Because um, you you that's almost an intangible at times. Some guys just don't have it, that, that sort of self-awareness. So that's fun. That's fun to hear. Um, I, I want him to stay aggressive. That floater, I'm loving the Doug floater, dude. Like, I want to see more of that. I want to put the opposing big man in jail when they slouch off on the on the uh, ball screen defense and they're, like, daring him to do it. I mean, he hit three of them last game. It looked really beautiful. He's got to keep doing it. Uh, I want to see more of Joey Baker. I want to see him getting minutes, and I want to see him staying aggressive offensively. Like, he should be shooting six or seven threes a game. In 18 minutes, I don't care. Shoot six or seven, shoot eight. You're going to get – well, he's going to hit three one game, whether it's two or three or four, and then maybe some games five. Like, it's going to make a world of difference, and he's going to be scoring more than one point per possession, which is huge in college basketball. So mm-hmm. I want to see more of that. Um, and, oh, I had a last point. But basically, you know, that, that the aggressiveness. Oh, the free throws. Yeah, again, just the, the direct aggressiveness from everybody. They they shot over twenty free throws, maybe over twenty five free throws in back. Twenty, I think twenty five free throws last year. Yeah, time. and then twenty nine in Maryland. And I don't know if they've really done that all year. Not definitely not gone back to back shooting more than twenty five free throws. I, I can't imagine that. So that is huge, and it and it's top to bottom, right? And it starts with Hunter. Like Hunter's aggressiveness mm-hmm. reverberates to the entire team when he gets guys. He gets. I mean multiple guys on each team he's gotten in foul trouble in both in all these games and, and it, that's mm-hmm. it is massive when you have to go to your eighth or ninth man to be guarding hunter it's not gonna it's not doesn't bode well for the other opposing team it's gonna mess up their offensive flow it's gonna mess up their defensive flow it's not good so to to keep that aggressiveness from everybody and to keep feeding off of that whether they're missing shots or making shots it doesn't matter stay confident and you're gonna need that going into breslin because um confidence can evaporate real quick so i don't know it'll be fun i think those are all good points it'll be this this team is fun it's it's a it's a roller coaster ride eerily similar to last year you didn't know what you were going to get last year with guys and last year's team got uh ridiculed a lot more there's a lot more expectations there but similar roller coaster this year and to be honest with you, I don't really view it too much roller coaster like i i expect it like whatever performance they give it's not surprising because I think you and me have a good sense of what this team is about. I sounded a little arrogant, um, but I think we know what this team is about and what they're capable of. Um, so, yeah, I'm excited for Michigan State and Iowa. And then we'll be back after that. I don't know if you got any closing thoughts, Nick. No, I mean, um, you know, 3-0 and in, in Big Ten play. And, and these, are, these are two – these are two very winnable games. I think the Iowa is definitely a, a winnable game, but if you win at Michigan State and then you beat Iowa, you start five and zero. Oh, you know, I talked about this similar to my experience my sophomore year, where we struggled in non-conference play and then opened up. I think nine and zero in Big Ten play, and it just gives you a whole new world of momentum moving forward and confidence. And I just think, you know, with that meeting that took place, obviously these two wins were great to kind of get back on track. But these next two games, if you can win at Breslin and beat Iowa, there's going to – people are going to start talking and people are going to start taking notice about this team. So, you know, I hope they bring their A game. I hope they come focused and they're locked in like they were these last two games because it's it's been truly a pleasure to watch them when they're given that second and third effort on defense and everyone's playing together and – you can just see it too. The bench is more engaged. Everyone's been everyone's been so much more positive and energetic, um, and it's been showing. So I hope they continue that moving forward. Yeah, I mean, you know, you've experienced it. The Big Ten is winning the games that you should win. 
and then picking off a few that you weren't the favorites in. And I think this team is fully capable of that. Let's not forget, everybody, that they are barely into, like, I don't know how many games it's been since Jalen got hurt. They're all just still settling into their new roles and rotations. Um, you know, freshmen have not, not even played 15 games yet total, I think is what it is. No, yeah, not even 15 games total. So they still have a long ways to go, but they've, they have improved a lot over the last couple games, and it's fun to watch. So stay patient with them. I, I plead with you to stay patient because uh, this team is fully capable. But I'm excited. Nick, we'll be back, I believe, after the Iowa game. We'll have to look at the schedule. But we'll be back. We appreciate all of you listening. Uh, tune in, subscribe. You can listen on all platforms. Uh, chirp us on Twitter. We love questions. We would love some questions. Hit up me or Nick. I don't know if Nick's reacting, but I am. SWD underscore 317. Hit me up for any questions. Um, and we'll, we'll answer them on the pod. Maybe we'll do a, a question segment if we get enough of them. Or just kind of... Uh, disperse them in there throughout the podcast so yeah hit us up um rate it review subscribe whatever the case may be and until next time thank you guys thank you beyond the big 10 is a network of podcasts that aims to be your go-to resource for all things big 10 we cover the entire conference with shows hosted by ex-players and athletic alumni aiming to be your go-to source of information and entertainment for your favorite team Hosted by ex-Big Ten players, media, and insiders, our podcasts are focused on giving diehard fans and those alums an inside scoop about the teams and people that make the Big Ten Conference one of the most watched and most talked about conferences in sports. We're excited to talk Big Ten basketball with you wherever you may be. Subscribe now.